Listen, tonight we're going to have fun, but I just, I, I feel like we need to shake it up just a little bit. Can you just, can you just say, come on, it's not that big of a deal, okay? Right? My shirt's from Amazon, my shoes are from, just in case you're wondering. Oh, Navy. Okay. It's not a big deal. We're all here doing the same thing. We all want to be like Jesus and be a bunch of girls that love him a whole lot. Right. So tonight, like, I know I have like the weirdest accent right now. It's like really thick. Okay. It's not normal. We're going to read some stuff, but I heard the Lord for you. And I'll say this. He loves you because I am not one to do this. This is not what I do. I'm more prophetic in nature. I am more of an intercessor. So I'm kind of a closet dweller. So being on the stage is a big deal for me, like anxious wide wise. And so for me to talk to you and to convey what God wants to say is a big deal. So for him to even have given me a word for you, just know it's a big deal. Okay. But he did. And I don't know how to handle this. Okay. Remember, this is not normal for me. I want to talk about Joseph. And this is why I want to talk about Joseph. At the beginning of the year, I have a couple pastors in my life that speak to me and speak into my life. And we went to, God, y'all are everywhere. I have to turn a lot. Okay, so we went to Dallas. And when we went to Dallas for our conference, he said this one phrase that really stuck with me, and it irritated me. And I couldn't figure out why, but it really just, you ever had somebody say something and you're just like, what did they mean by that? Why would they say that? You know, what, what was he trying to convey when he said that? And really try to break it down. And he said this, he said, I want to give you permission to dream again. That's what he said. And I begin to think about my life and, and who I am and, and how I function. And okay, I'm a mama. I got three kids. I've been raising them for 20 something years. Okay. That's what I've been doing. I don't have a whole lot of dreams outside of that. They're kind of it. So when he said, it's, it, I, I give you permission to dream again. I thought, what am I supposed to dream about? What does that mean? And so, I don't know why, but it just irritated me to the point of going into intercession for it. And I walked out of that room and I went downstairs. And I mean, we're in a hotel. My husband's sound. He's taking a nap. I mean, he is hitting it hard and I'm he's snoring. And I'm like, I can't think I got to go downstairs. So I go downstairs and I sit down and I'm like, I'm sitting there weeping before the Lord God. I don't have any dreams like I don't have any dreams. I don't have any aspirations. I don't, my my kids are like, I just want to see my kids do well. I'm not the kind of person that's going to create some nonprofit that's going to save the world. I'm just not that person. That's not how I think. I'm not a visionary by nature. It's not, my husband is, and he, he tries to kill me on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. But how many of y'all have husbands like that? He wants to do, we're going to do this and we're going to do this. or, Or you are that person. I'm sorry. But we're going to do this and we're going to do this and we're the planner, okay? That's not normally my realm of, of how I think. So when I begin to think about this, I thought, I don't really have that many dreams. To the point where on the way home from Dallas, I was fussing at my husband. He says, what's the matter with you? You got really quiet. And I said, well, I just... I don't know. I don't know what he was talking about. I don't know what Pastor Jim was talking about when he said, I give you permission to dream again. It really bugs me. It bothers me. I don't really have that many dreams in the inside of my heart that I feel like are necessary for me to start dreaming again. Like there, you know, I've done everything I can do. I'm still, you know, my kids are going to college. My kids are going, finishing high school. I've got one getting married. I mean, I think that we're doing okay where we're at. And my perspective of dreaming of having a dream was more based upon the lines of a visionary and a leader and not an actual dreamer. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, I was in the bathroom the other day. I'm on the phone. I'm getting ready for work. And I'm talking to my friend. 
And I said, God, I've had three dreams this week. Right? Man, I used to dream all the time. Like every night I would dream for weeks at a time. And since we've been pastors for six years, I haven't dreamt very much. There's not been very many dreams coming to me from God. How many of you are dreamers? Yeah, you get what I'm saying, right? Like you go through, you have like a really wonky dream, like you were on a motorcycle and then the next dream you're doing something for God, okay? So you start dreaming again, okay? So you're a dreamer. I used to dream all the time and I would write my dreams down and they'd be very prophetic. And I started to dream again. So I'm telling my friend, I'm like, oh, I'm dreaming again. This is amazing. I haven't dreamt like this in years. Not that I wasn't dreaming kind of, sort of. Every now and then, but I'm talking day after day after day. And I said, man, you know, a couple of my friends have been calling me and they dream all the time. It's like they just bring me all the dreams and I've got everybody's dreams, but I didn't dream for a long time. And I heard the Lord say this. How do you think Joseph felt? And I went, wait, hang on. He said he was a dreamer. And I thought, whoa, that's what you were talking about. That's why it was unsettling to me. I didn't recognize what he was saying when he said it. What he was really speaking to was my heart. He wasn't talking to my function. He was talking to my spirit. And I didn't equate that when my pastor said, I give you permission to dream again. I thought, I thought action not God speaking to my spirit. I thought function, not anointing. Does that make sense? So I kind of want to talk to you about Joseph. We're going to read a little bit about Joseph. Everybody with me? In that conversation with my friend, I said, hmm, it seems as though God is speaking to me about dreams and a dreamer and the cycle of a dreamer. And so I'm going to walk through a few things about what I found when I began to read about Joseph. Does that make sense? Everybody there? Let's see. 30, uh, Genesis 37, 1 through 11. We're going to do Genesis 37, 1 through 11. I think they have the, the... Yep, there we go. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Billah, and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Come on, he's being a, a little brother. Who has a little brother? My kids would say, a little brother type beat. I guess that's what they would say. My well, middle school kids, they know what that means. <laughs> so he's giving his daddy a bad report about his brothers, Okay. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for Joseph. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of the others, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to this dream that I had. We were binding sheaths of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheath rose and stood upright, while your sheaths gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Again, he's being a little brother. And his brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him, all the more because of the dream that he had said he had. Then he had another dream. So he's dreaming again. Here we go. Here's the dreamer. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father's rebuke, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you've had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down on the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. Well, first time they hated him. Now they're jealous. But his father kept this matter in his heart. His first dream, all the sheets bowing down, right? Second dream, the moon and the stars and all of his brothers bowing down, all the stars. 
All the little brothers are angry at Joseph. Why? Because they're jealous. Because he's getting dreams. This dream that he had, both of them, created jealousy. It created hate. Even to the point of his brothers deciding that they were going to murder him. If you read this story in Genesis, it talks about how they they begin to plot to kill Joseph because they hated him so badly. They couldn't say a kind word to him. They didn't care for him. Have you ever had a dream? Any dream at all? You ever wanted to be a dancer? You ever wanted to be a singer? You ever thought you might be a famous singer when you were an adult? Yes, I did. I thought I was going to be. Wasn't. <laughs> you ever wanted to be a nurse or a doctor or an astronaut or a unicorn? Nobody ever wanted to do that, right? Just me. Okay. When you get this dream, when you feel like this is the dream that you have, what happens? It's like you get hope, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to do everything it takes to make this happen. Isn't that how you feel? There's hope there. There's like, ooh, there's like a, there's a fervor. There's an, there's, it's almost like there's like an igniting in your spirit that says, this can happen, right? Then you share it. Come on, I'm hearing y'all grunting. Then you share your dream. And what happens when you share your dream? When you share your dream, you open your heart up. Because a dream comes from your heart, right? Like Joseph, we begin to speak about our dream to others, and not everybody hears your dream or sees your dream the way that you have been shown or see. So we get personal comments injected into our dreams. And then what happens? Let me tell you what some voices might sound like. Some of these that I know, you might know them too. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? That's too big. You can't accomplish that. That's not the way it's done. You don't have enough money to go to college. Anybody? Ever hear these voices? You don't have enough money to fly around the world. You can't go on mission trips. You can't homeschool your kid. You're going to ruin them. There are a million businesses just like the one you're talking about. Why in the world would you make a business like that? We don't need another one. You'll never get that job. You're not qualified. Come on. Y'all ever heard those voices? That's not God's voice. I'll just say that. Joseph's brothers, much like the voices that you have heard, create some apprehension and they cause us to doubt that the dream has even been spoken. Because it's just not going to work, right? It's just too big. It's just too much. Then it comes time to really choose whether or not you're going to let the dream live or die in your heart. You ever had to pick that? You're going to let this dream live or die? I mean, I see, listen, y'all might think you're a unicorn. I don't see any unicorns in here. So your dream of being a unicorn didn't make it. You ever just had to let something die? It was extremely painful. I know I'm making fun. I feel like laughter kind of curbs some of the (laughs) pain a little bit. And if you read my bio, I mean, that's my favorite thing to do is make people laugh. So, But have you ever had that happen where you have to choose whether or not you're going to let something live or die in your heart? I have. Then, you know, here comes Joseph again, and his dad goes, hey, I need you to go check on your brothers, okay? This is in Genesis, um, I think, 37, 12 through 18. He's like, go go check on your brothers. Go, 
you know, go check on them and make sure they're not doing anything they're not supposed to do. So here comes little brother. Y'all got little brothers, right? Somebody got a little brother in here. I have a little brother, and he's a rat. And he's like 34, and he's still a rat. They don't ever grow up. So Joseph goes up, and as soon as he walks up to his brothers, what do they begin to do? Oh, here comes the dreamer. Here comes that dreamer. And then they decide to talk about him out loud and make a mockery of him by saying, here comes the dreamer. What are, what's he going to do now? What's he found himself doing now? What has he been dreaming about now? You ever have people do that to you? If not, just wait. Because it's not people that do that. It's the enemy that does that. The enemy makes a mockery. The enemy ridicules. The enemy tries to make you feel small. Not people. It's always what happens when you dream. Right? Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other in Genesis 37, 19 through 20. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into these cisterns and stay and say that the ferocious animals devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. I mean, if you're a dreamer, you know what I'm talking about. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They even set out to destroy him so that his dreams never came to pass. And they're saying it in front of him. They're saying it to him. Isn't that more painful? Wouldn't you just rather somebody just say you're going to fail behind your back? But why do they have to say it right to your face? That's just how the enemy is, right? Come on. You can't do that. That's not how it's done. You're not smart enough to make it there. You'll never make it there. You don't have enough money to live in that neighborhood. You don't have this. You don't have that. You can't ever do this. You'll never be a doctor. You'll never be a lawyer. It sounds a whole lot like the devil. A whole lot like the devil. Here's point one. If the enemy is mocking you, you are definitely dreaming. You're a dreamer. There's your key. If he starts fighting back, it's because you're a dreamer. I truly believe that the enemy of our soul still has the same tactic today that he had towards that dreamer. He mocks. He ridicules. He sets out to abort the dream of God in your heart. So that it never comes to pass. Abortion is not just for the unborn. Abortion is for anything that God sets into motion that the enemy wants to take out before it can have any legacy. Because abortion isn't just killing one baby. It's killing a family line. That's what generational, that's what generational abortion is. That's also what it does in dreams. He's still the same enemy that he was with Joseph. And then we see Joseph going into the pit in Genesis 39. If you just keep reading through the scriptures, it says it, it, Joseph, uh, his brothers throw him in the pit. They leave him there to die. They go back and tell his dad and lie to him that he's dead. They bring his robe that his dad created for him. And they tell him, oh, he's, he's dead, dad, like a, an animal, a wild beast got a hold of him. All the while, Joseph's being sold into Egypt, back into slavery after God has delivered his people from Egypt. He's bringing him back into Egypt in slavery. The very people he set free. So he's sold into Potiphar's house. And who is Potiphar? Does anybody know who Potiphar is? Has anybody read the scriptures? In the story of Joseph being sold into Egypt, he goes into Potiphar's house. And Potiphar is the head executionist for the king. That's a pretty rough house, I'd say. Wouldn't you? I mean, this guy's like, he's, 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 a, he's, a, he's not a good dude. He's probably a murderer. A lot. And Joseph is a man with integrity. He loves the Lord. He prays. He seeks God's face. He's also a Hebrew. The Bible says that Joseph was over everything because of his integrity and his character in Potiphar's house. Think about that. Everything that the enemy was doing, Joseph is, is, is just like, Okay, let me, let me make this better. Let me fix this. Let me put this in order. Let me. Did you ever think about that? It says that Potiphar didn't worry about anything in his home 
except for what he ate because Joseph took care of everything. Joseph was literally running the house of the man that was second in command to Egypt. But Joseph's dreams were tested. The dreamer was tested. Why? Because the woman of the house tried to steal his character, tried to steal his integrity, tried to steal his purity. And here she is trying to steal from him. Isn't that what the enemy does? Tries to steal from us, tries to put us in position to look bad, our character to be sullied, our integrity to be made gossiped about, destroyed. As the enemy tried to assassinate your character when you're in the middle of trying to do a dream that you have in your heart for God. <laughs> if he hasn't, then you're not dreaming enough. Listen, gossip, lies, that's the fastest way to kill a dream if, if people believe it. Because it spreads. It's like a bad disease. Can I just say, don't get, in, don't get involved in that over other people's lives. There's a dream of God inside of them. And you need to, to check your mouth before you begin to repeat. Because it's an assassination. Not to you, but to the things of heaven. Point two. Your dreams will be tested. Not if. When. It's not an if that your dreams will be tested. It is a when they are tested. Don't be shaken. It's the same tactic of the enemy. He never changes his tactics. They're always the same. It's the same for that dreamer. It's the same for this one. Gossip, lies, slander, anything of the sort to try to destroy the things of heaven. Remember who wins and remember who loses. When you have a dream in your heart as a dreamer of God, don't allow the enemy to have a hand in anything that God has planned for. Nothing. You don't give him an inch. You don't give him anything. So because Potiphar's wife tried to assault his character and his integrity, what happens to Joseph? He gets thrown in prison because Potiphar gets angry. And he says, well... You're not going to do this to me. I'll let you have everything in my house. I'll let you do whatever you wanted. And here you are. You're just, you know, trying to take my wife too. So he throws him in prison. And here's Joseph. All through the end of uh, Genesis 39 and 40. He's in prison. But guess what happens in prison? When you're anointed, your anointing's not stolen when the enemy comes in and tries to steal it. He might try to steal your character. He might try to steal your integrity. But the anointing is from God. And so what happens to Joseph? Joseph is set to rule over everything in the prison. In the middle of the prison, he's the leader, the ruler. Everybody's got to go through Joseph. He's in the dungeon, and he's the head guy. Isn't that insane? The anointing of God is still in his life. God puts him in position of authority even in the lowest of his moments. Your anointing is not dead just because you're in lockdown. When the dream is tried to be stolen, it's not dead. It's just in lockdown. In the beginning of Genesis 40, Joseph is leading everyone in the prison. He's the guy over everybody. You got to go through Joseph if you want extra bread. You got to go through Joseph if you want to go to the bathroom. You got to go through Joseph if you need to get out. And here comes the cupbearer and the baker. And they say, we've got dreams. <laughs> Can you interpret? Why do you think that happens? This is another cycle, I think. In the process of a dreamer, I think that personal dream dormancy is evidence when people become, when people be, begin to bring you their dreams, but yours is not happening. Think about that. When dreams go dormant and others begin to bring you dreams to interpret, 
Your anointing is not dead. It's just in lockdown. Here's some indicators, okay? If you're in a dreaming dormancy, let me just say this. If your personal dreams aren't coming to pass and other people are bringing you stuff and saying, hey, help me do this. Hey, I want to start this. Hey, I need help with this. Can you tell me what next step I need to take for this? I need a 501c3. I need to do this. I need to do that. Hey, can you help me go here? I need to do some flags over here. Hey, can you help me? Um, Can you help me watch a bunch of kids because I want to open a daycare? Can you help me do this? Can you help me do? And people are just coming to you and just tossing their dreams in your lap. And yours is just sitting there staring you in the face, but not not doing anything. Here are some indicators that your dreams are dormant for a season. Yearning for something that someone else seems to gain easily. You ever done that? I really, God, I just really need to do this. And you start praying and fasting and seeking God. And it's like, and then your best friend comes to you and says, guess what I got? So awesome. Exactly what you were needing from God. And you're like, that's so great. Hmm. So happy for you. Because we're Christians, right? We're supposed to be happy for people. What about this one? You can't celebrate when someone else gets something that you think that you've been praying harder for. So you become... Jealous. Sounds a whole lot like Joseph's brothers. Or you can't celebrate when that happens. You can't be like, oh, I'm so excited for you. Yes, I want to be a part of that. What about why do I have to wait and they didn't? You ever, you ever thought that? You ever, you ever thought, that? look, I lo- yes. She's like, yeah, girl. Yes. Everybody has. Everybody has. When dreamers start coming to you when you're in that state, what will you do? Will you become jealous? Will you become envious? Will you withhold information that you have that they probably need? Will you withdraw and hold love from them? Or excitement for them? Or... Anything that they need from you? Prayer? I believe a dreamer has a responsibility to, uh, responsibility to allow their dreams to lay forgotten. Hear me. While they help others achieve sometimes the very cry of their own heart. There have been many times. This is a dream. I just want you to know, like the Lord just spoke to me. This is a dream. He gave me this dream that I'd be speaking to women. And you know what? I told him I didn't want to. This is, this is some, this is a dream coming to pass. You have a responsibility when you're laying dormant in your own dream life to propel people into their very destiny. And as a pastor, I do that on a daily basis. People come to me with dreams and vision and excitement. And I can either go, or I can go, yes, let's run to get, what are we doing? Okay, yes, okay. How are we going to make this work in the church? How are we going to make this work outside the church? What do you need from me? But I can't be in a place where I'm jealous. I can't be in a place where I'm like, what about me, God? What, why, why isn't this happening? How come it was so easy for them and everything's so hard for me? You ever said that? Why is everything so hard? I have said that. That is like my favorite line to the Lord. Why is everything so hard for me? It makes me better. It needs to be hard. For, I'm hard headed. <laughs> my husband told me something the other day. He said, baby, you all I can handle. And I can barely handle you. So, 
<laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. Because we also have another daughter. And then we got another daughter-in-law coming on the way. And I'm like, well, you're about to have a house full. So the anointing is on you still. It has not left you when your dreams are dormant. It hasn't left you. The anointing is different for you to utilize it in a different season. You have to learn to pivot. You ever heard somebody say that? Pivot. Change direction. Change your mindset. Remove your brain out of your head that was pointing that direction and make it go a different one. You have to change your mind. Your anointing is still there. Your anointing is from God. Your function, on the other hand, changes in many seasons. It hasn't changed. Use your time that you get to do this very wisely. And this is why. You are speaking to somebody's destiny and a dream of God. Don't abort, don't help the enemy abort the mission. Don't help him. Repent if you've done that and ask God forgiveness and don't do that again. Don't do that again. I have like one minute. I got to hurry up. Joseph was in the prison. Let me just I'll run through it, okay? Joseph was in the prison and the cupbearer and the... Baker come to him and he, they, he interprets their dreams. The cupbearer ends up getting out of prison. The baker ends up being killed, impaled because he was not a good guy. And so the cupbearer goes out and he's serving the king again for two years. And the king begins to have some very prophetic dreams about what's happening in Egypt. And so he says, I can't get anybody to tell me anything. Nobody wants to interpret my dreams. They're all afraid of him because he's crazy. And so he says, well, I know this guy. And the cupbearer says, I know this guy. He did this for me in the prison. His name is Joseph. So the king sends for Joseph to come out. And he comes out of the dungeon. And he says, tell me my dreams. And you know what Joseph does? Man, Joseph has matured. (laughs) He's not, hey, you guys are going to bow down to me. Watch this. He's like, I'm not going to give you that interpretation. I'm going to let God do that. It's not on me. It's on him. He's matured. Joseph matured in the dungeon and his relationship with God grew greatly. Dreamers grow in dungeons. That's what happens. That's the fourth point. That's the third point. Third, fourth. Yeah, one of them. Dreamers grow in dungeons. That's what happens. Dungeons cause a dreamer to continuously su- surrender the dream of God and not sacrifice their God for the dream. How many become so focused on the dream that they forget to even talk to God anymore about it? They just run really hard towards the dream. They forget Jesus. Always surrender your dream to God. Do not sacrifice your God to the dream. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then everything that you need will be added unto you. Come on, Matthew 6, 33. His brothers come and they declare, you know, all this stuff. Oh, you know, dad's still alive, la, la, la. They find out that it's Joseph because he tells them. And he's weeping and he says, listen, don't be distressed that you sold me to slavery. I was here in a time where I needed to save lives. God put me here. That's what he tells them. In Genesis 45, 5 and 8, he's talking to him. He's like, don't worry. Listen, his dreams are coming to pass, but not the way that he thought. His brothers come in, and because they think he's the Pharaoh, they bow before him. And everything that he thought he wanted, he got, but he really didn't want that in his dream. He wanted reconciliation now. He matured to a place where he now can dream kingdom dreams with God and not just selfish ones. Sometimes your dreams that are laying dormant in dungeons cause you to mature so that you can come hand in hand with heaven. We're not mature enough sometimes to walk out our dreams. 
We think we are. We get overzealous. And we can ruin some stuff. How many of us can ruin some stuff? I can ruin some stuff, okay? So I just have some altar calls. Is that okay? Why don't y'all stand with me? I have a few. I, I want to declare this over you because I think that it needs to be declared. Here comes the dreamers. Because here's the deal. We have to dream with God. We don't get to not dream with God. The question that I had in my heart wasn't whether or not I was to dream. It was whether or not I was a visionary. Not everybody is a visionary. Some of you are, and it's amazing. But some of you just need to learn to dream again and let God speak to your spirit. Let God awaken things in your heart. So I just, I want to give a couple altar calls. Oh, there you are. Hey. The first one's going to be for this. I've got three. You can come up at any time. I, if my girls, these are my girls. I, lo- I love them. I trust them. Every one of them are uh, prayer warriors. They serve on our altar ministry team at our church. But I just, I asked Pastor Brandon and Cassie if it would be okay if I brought some of my girls just for, sometimes it's really hard to come up to your friend and tell them what the problem is. Okay. So these girls, you might not know them. And if you do go to somebody you don't know if you need to, but I just, I want them to come and just kind of line up right here. And they're going to be here just to pray over you, just to speak life over you. They don't know your situation. And sometimes that's, that's better, right? You don't got to give them a whole background check of, you know, everything you've ever done. They don't need blood. They don't need a fingerprint. They just, they just, they're going to come pray for you. Y'all come on up and thank you. I can tell you all their names, but it would take me a minute. So this is what I want the altar call to be for. Those who dream had a dream and then it was just blatantly discouraged. Like it was just like, you can't do this. You won't do this. This is not how this is done. You'll never become this. You're too dumb for that. You can't watch that many kids. You can't do this. You can't have this many babies. You'll, you'll never become a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. You'll never have enough money to go to college. You'll never move out of that neighborhood. You'll never. Those. Those. Those are the ones that I'm going to call up first. The Bible says this. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, it says that we have a high priest. That we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. The things that we have, okay? The things that we deal with. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. That we get to approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and grace in our time of need. Sometimes our dreams died because we killed them. And sometimes our dreams died because they lay dormant. You didn't do what God asked you to do. Sometimes our dream died because somebody spoke death over it. So I just, I, if that's you, if you've never dreamt with God, if you don't, if that question like rakes your spirit and you're like, I feel like you felt. I didn't like that. I don't like that you're asking me or you're giving me permission to dream again. What does that even mean, lady? God wants to speak to you. Or if that's you that says, I did have a dream. And you know what? I let the enemy abort it. And he wasn't aborting it for me. I'm disgruntled at the fact that he aborted the mission. I thought it was against me, but it was really against God to stop the thing of God, to stop the plan of heaven. And I let him. And I'm just asking God, maybe he might give me a second chance. Because he will. Because he's good like that. The second altar call is going to be for this. Dreamers that that are in a season of maturing. I'm talking to some leaders in here. Listen, or some business owners or some people that have someone's destiny in their hand and you are speaking death over that destiny or you are not allowing them to be greater than you. If that's you, repent. Come and get prayer. Ask God to help you to become mature leaders so that when people come to you with big dreams that you don't understand, you 
you won't be the one that will harm them. You'll be the one that will push them towards greatness in their calling and anointing and that God's kingdom will be made known through them. And you'll have had a hand in that. Come on. I want to pour into those people's hearts just a prayer of long suffering because a lot of times we're so hurt that our dreams haven't come to pass that we refuse to allow somebody else's to come forth. Long suffering cures that. God says that we can pray for long suffering. Patience. Come on. And then for the dreamers coming out of the dungeon dungeon and being ready for the dream to be activated. They need to be able to be aligned with heaven. They need to learn who they need to go to, who they need to connect to. Come on, there's some people in here, I feel it, that have a dream that go, I just don't know who to bring this to. I don't know where to go with this. I don't, listen, and there don't have to be a massive amount of people come to the altar because the Lord told me singular It's going to be good. Singular. uh, Yeah, it's going to be good. Okay. Anyway, singular activation. You're coming out the dungeon and you're ready for the dream, but you got to seek great humility. You have to stay low. Listen, there's, there's something that comes with something with God. When he, when he says here, I'm going to trust you with this. It's not yours. And that's where you need to sit. It's not mine. It's his. It's heaven's. It belongs to heaven. And I'm just stewarding something. But I got to be a good steward. And you don't know who to go to. You don't know who who to tell. You don't know how to connect. You don't know what the next step is. I want to pray for you. Come on. That you'll be placed in places of authority because of your integrity and character. And God's anointing on your life will not be removed from you while you're there waiting that you'll be able to submit to that authority and allow God to move whenever He needs to and however He needs to. If you wouldn't mind standing with me. Thank you guys for letting me um, speak into your life. I appreciate it.